Okay. Right. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, JJ or Jimmy Johnson. Uh, I'm uh, one of the founding members of Decolonize Detroit and, um, and have been kind of like a decolonizing activist and anti apartheid activist, both in the United States and Palestine, uh, for a good long while now. Uh, most of the writing I do is specifically about settler colonialism. What, what I want to do real quick here is talk about, um, just with apologies, like a little bit of basics about co colonialism, settler colonialism, real brief. But what I want this to be is a prompt into a more critical discussion. Um, laying out the history of, of colonialism or settler colonialism is the easy part for me. The questions of decolonization are much more difficult, and I don't purport to have the answers to them. And so I'm hoping the collective intelligence of the room, we can have a really productive discussion. Um, and so, and by basic, I mean kind of not, uh, I mean like the base power relationships, the basic power relationship, not so much, um, you know, a couple little historical moments or something like that. And so uh, I want to begin with some of the relevance of it, even just for us in this room, some of the relevance of uh, colonialism. And it's not just because the UK still keep Diego Garcia, the US has Guajan, Samoa, Puerto Rico, and other formal, what we would consider much more like, like, like Franz Fanon described colonialism, like what we call metropole colonialism. Um, but, but there's, like even inside our radical movements where we tend to think that we're being you know, very, very critical, very aware of power relationships. And so I borrowed a book. Um, actually, I'll use, I'm gonna, I, I try and integrate whatever I'm reading at the moment into the discussion, because otherwise I'll, I'll fucking forget it. So um, a couple of books that, that I've just finished reading, one's called Decolonizing Anarchism, which I found to be a pretty tremendous book, actually, uh, by AK Press. And then uh, this one that's just come out called The Arab Spring, uh, The End of Post-Colonialism by uh, Hamid Dabashi, um, which I find to be pretty fascinating as well. But one of the reasons it's relevant, because AK Press, just a couple years ago, put out this book. So it's called The Living Revolution, Anarchism in the Kibbutz Movement. I'll be using a lot of analogies from, from Israel because I'm also Israeli. And uh, I find a lot of times when we're inside a kind of a colonial context, inside a settler framework, it's not that different than being inside, say, white supremacy. So making white privilege very hard to see for white people. Uh, the idea of being a settler is hard to see for people inside settler societies, generally speaking. Um, and so I'll, I think analogies using, using Zionism in Israel by analogy, I think uh, can be quite illuminating because we're not immersed in that context, unless you, you guys are all Israeli too. Um, I didn't catch that in the intros though. So, but anyway, so this book just came out a couple of years ago and it's called, uh, it is also by AK Press, you know, Radical Anarchist Press. And as opposed to Maya's book, uh, which is called Decolonizing Anarchism, this one, Anarchism in the Kibbutz Movement, should be called Colonizing Anarchism. It's kind of a, a preposterous idea to me. Um, the idea, I mean, the very formation of the kibbutzim, the kibbutz is a collective, uh, 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 a, a collective model of living and labor arrangements that comes out of um, the struggle to compete with Palestinian laborers in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, the first one is called the Degania, and uh, Degania was specifically put, uh, put together because the, the colonizing workers, the Zionist workers, didn't want to uh, work for Palestinian wages. Um, and so they created a space in, which I think is illustrative and one of the kind of nuts and bolts of at least the settler society. And so what, what they did is they created a space of exclusive sovereignty. And this is one of the basics of settler colonialism, is that um, if we... Uh, I'll step back with a little bit of a narrative that leads into this, I guess. At, at a meeting in um, Detroit, this would be almost a year and a half ago now, uh, our re one of our representatives, Hanson Clark, who's a congressman, and about as progressive as you get in U.S. Congress, you know, pretty decent guy, um, he's given, uh, a, a leading a, a little bit of a discussion about immigration uh, raids, uh, immigration customs enforcement, border patrol raids in Detroit, where people were acting bad, even by the standards of uh, ICE and Border Patrol. Um, so they were arresting people you know, outside of churches as they was waiting to pick up their children you know, uh, from school and things like that. And so he gives this great discussion, uh, or kind of like this great little talk, and, uh, but, but it's a really hot room. It's a really hot room. It's totally full of people. The microphone breaks, and these fans are going because it's so hot, so no one can hear him. So he climbs up on the table, and he, and, and he ends this really, really kind of on-point thing by saying, you know, with this fist in the air, he says, we are a nation of immigrants. And, uh, and that's pretty much the standard uh, discourse for, for those of us who work for, for migrant justice inside the, the United States. And 
to a certain degree in Canada and other settler societies as well. As we point to this history of immigration, um, as a reason to, to point out how our current um, uh, immigration policy is so racist. Say, look, none of us come from here, so what's the problem with you know, Mexican immigration or Haitian immigration or, or whatever? We use it to point out this racism, but, um, but we're actually not. There's almost no immigrants here. Uh, we're a nation of settlers, and there's a fundamental difference there. When you immigrate someplace, you join a political body or, or a sovereignty of some kind that's pre-existing. Now, you may transform it over time. If there's lots of immigrants, you're eventually going to tra uh, transform this place that you articulate to. Settlers don't. Settlers, as settlers, we bring our own sovereignty, and we displace the pre-existing sovereignty that's there. And so um, the, and the distinction to be made is that you know, countless millions have settled in, in North America. Very few have immigrated to Turtle Island, um, or you can pick a different term for the indigenous continent. And, uh, and that gets to, back to this as well. What happened in the Ganyan with the Kibbutzim is creating a space of settler sovereignty. And so in Hebrew, we talk about the Bilyuim and, you know, and, the, and, and the, uh, the, the, the immigrants is the language that we use in Hebrew as well. But what we really should be saying is settler. Um, and so that's maybe a question to think about for a little bit later is what, what's an anarchistic vision of migrant justice but a decolonized one? where we're talking about you know, not, not, not this idea of immigrants, but decolonizing us as a settler society, or perhaps trying to become a nation of immigrants. Um, so that, that's one little part about the current relevance. Uh, another part is that we've got this discussion, 99%, 1%, so on and so forth. And, and rather than 99% and 1%, which we associate with the Occupy, I, I prefer a different little formula. And it's... Um, one that kind of describes, like, I think a, uh, um, a more accurate um, idea of wealth distribution, at least in settler societies. And that's, uh, I have really bad handwriting, so you'll forgive me. And that's red lands plus black labor equals white gold. And by and large, that's the history of the United States. Or in a variant, that would be the history of most settler societies. There are slight differences in South Africa or Israel or Australia. I mean, the differences uh, are there. I don't mean to say that it's all the same, but it's analogous in uh, virtually every settler society, possible exception to Liberia. Um, but, um, and so th this relevance, and this will be one of the first analogies, I guess, uh, to make, is that <clears throat> in Israel, we had what was called the July 14th movement, and it was the 10 cities that, that popped up all over the country, uh, mostly complaining about um, austerity measures, cuts in social benefits, and a lot of the stuff we hear inside Occupy. Now, one of the slogans of this was Ham Doris de Khabrati, which means the people demand, Ham means the people. The people demand social justice. And so, um, now inside there, we had all kinds of demands about uh, reducing commodity prices, because fuel is outrageous. Reduce housing prices, because the housing market in Israel, especially in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, is just insane. Um, and so we had all kinds of demands about this, um, but half the population under direct Israeli control is Palestinian. This doesn't even count the millions in refugee camps in Lebanon and elsewhere. So half under the direct control is Palestinian, but Palestinian demands aren't in there at all. And so when the people demand just social justice, it's, we're using a very uh, colonized language to talk about the people. Who's the people? Well, implicit in this is that Palestinians aren't people because their demands aren't included at all. And so when we talk about Occupy 99% and 1%, that's another part of, of, the, of the kind of the, mm, how colonized language is very much inside of our radical communities. We're talking about redistributing wealth with 99% and 1%, but whose wealth is it? It's the stolen lands and the stolen labor because that's where virtually all uh, North American uh, wealth comes from inside the settler societies. And so... Um, and, and the only real difference between the July 14th movement, I think, and Occupy Wall Street in making these demands is that in the United States, you had a relative amount of success with the genocide, whereas Palestinians still have a very visible presence inside Palestine. In the United States, the genocide was far more successful. Uh, Indian removal was far more successful than Palestinian removal. And thus, we can pretend like there's a categorical difference. Um, but uh, I, I don't actually think that's true at all. Now, um, coming back, one, one more, uh, I guess uh, just a couple more points here, is that in, um, 
um, inside, inside the U.S. as a settler society or any settler society, this question of settler versus indigenous sovereignty also lays out a different function of it. Uh, how as settler societies were eliminationist. Um, we, we, there's, there's an inherent eliminationism inside all of us as settler societies. It's not a coincidence that per capita, the largest homeless population in Hawaii today is indigenous Hawaiians. The, the process is settler colonialism or the settlement of a continent isn't something that happened. It's something that's happening. It's an ongoing process. Um, and um, it could also make, I think, a compelling case for why we should discuss uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in a very literal way as Indian wars as well, but I won't do that right here. Um, but this eliminationism takes all kinds of different forms. Sometimes it happens through a massacre. It can happen through a forced expulsion. It can happen by stealing the children of the indigenous population and bringing them up inside the settler society. In Israel, there's a group called Israeli Arabs, or that's what in the settler society we call them. They identify as Palestinian. Um, and it's an attempt to remove their indigeneity and articulate them instead through Israeli society. And so in Australia, you have what's called the Stolen Generations, and there's lots of uh, examples here as well. In uh, Israeli propaganda, they use uh, Israeli Arabs are like, oh, we are, we are such an accepting nation. Totally. We have all these uh, Israeli Arabs in positions of power. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, like, it's, the, uh, it's another way that we try to assage our guilt as settler societies by pointing, look, they're not all dead, you know, or something like that, where it, basically it's, it's, um, it's something that can barely excuse us, you know, uh, and I'm not phrasing that uh, correctly, I think, but, but it's something that, that we use a lot to kind of assage our own guilt. Um, and, of course, we don't point out that in 60 years there's been two cabinet ministers who are Palestinian, neither one who had an important uh, position nor has there ever been a Palestinian political party in a coalition government. But, um, um, and then just to kind of step back from this, from settler societies, uh, again, I'm, I'm being a little reductive. I'm trying to get through it really quick because I'm really interested in what you all have to say, what you all have to think. Um, just, so just a, one uh, last point, leaving aside settler societies, we're also looking at a different, I think a very interesting point in, in what we call metropole colonialism, the European relationships, to nations that they colonized but did not settle. Um, Britain and India, you know, uh, France and Tunisia, so on and so forth. Um, I think what we're seeing with, with the Arab Spring, and this is something I take a lot from uh, Dabashi's book, which is really tremendous. He's an Orthodox Marxist, so it's okay to boo. But, um, but I mean, he's a tremendous, tremendous analyst. I mean, he's a, he's a sharp cat. And, uh, and so, um, but one of the things he talks about is that what, what we're seeing, for example, in, uh, in uh, Tahrir Square or, or other places is not so much a, um, um, in, it's not just that it's a transformation of the local power relationships vis-a-vis -vis some dictator or a military regime, but what we're also seeing is a space where the revolt is against both uh, kind of the West or the North or whatever term you prefer, especially its concept as a center of knowledge, production, and power. But what we're also seeing is um, a revolt against the post-colonial state. The, the, idea that the, uh, the idea that the primary articulation of these revolts has something to do with the colonial state or with the former colonial powers. And he's calling it the end of, the end of kind of post, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the word, coloniality, does that sound right? So the end of post-coloniality. And um, uh, which is, if his analysis is on point, and at least for, for what, what and it doesn't seem preposterous to me anyway. Uh, I think I need to study a bit more. Um, but if, if his analysis is somewhat on point, then we're also looking at a pretty transformative period for other colonial and colonized relationships. Now that means little to a settler society. Inside settler societies, we think of our uh, decolonizing moment as when we broke from, say, Britain and the United States. Um, that's, when, that's when the 13 colonies were liberated, right? And so... And th this brings, uh, brings us to, I think, some of the fundamental questions. Inside a settler society, what do we mean by decolonization? I mean, are we looking at uh, Algeria? You know, the, the, what you could call the, uh, the Algerian model of decolonization? The South African model, Northern Ireland, New Zealand? There's lots of different ways that the questions have been addressed, some with expulsion of settlers, some with integration of settlers. You know, uh, and, uh, so that's a question. Uh, that I'm putting out there, because I, I don't purport to have the answer to it. Um, I think maybe between all of us in this room, we might have an inkling of it, though. Um, 
although maybe one of you has the answer on your own, which would be just, just as cool. Um, but um, so that, that's one of the questions that, that I'm really interested in. What do we even mean by decolonization? If, if one of the fundamentals of being a settler society is this con contestation of sovereignty, of settler sovereignty versus indigenous sovereignty, then how do we imagine this uh, as, uh, how do we imagine decolonization is happening? How do we find indigenous sovereignty? Native title, that could be one thing. I mean, there's probably lots of different things, but so that's one thing. Um, and then there's all kinds of other questions. What does it mean if we're working in solidarity, for example, with, with uh, Puerto Rican activists for decolonization? Does it mean that we want to fight for independence? A lot of the independence movement in Puerto Rico is right-wing business, you know, but not all of it. And so, I mean, but as anarchists, are we fighting for, for, for another state? You know? And so what do we mean? Like, how, how, do we, how do we operate properly in solidarity with, you know, with, 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 uh, with Puerto Rican activists, but um, you know, do so in an anarchistic way and in a decolonizing way, not buying into just the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico as the fundamental relationship of the power? You know, there's a, a different imagination. If we limit ourselves to that, then we're failing for imagination. And you could use the same thing for Guahan or Guam, you know, or in other places. And so uh, with that, uh, I just kind of like to break out into discussion, really. Um, I, I can talk forever about settler colonialism. I prefer not to because it's hella boring for you because uh, I'm not a good speaker. But, but uh, maybe with the discussion we can have, a, you know, maybe a better time with it. And so who's up? Yeah. Canada and Brazil, but I guess it also applies to, to Colombia, sure. Venezuela, and some other Latin American countries. We're not just specifically talking about settlers and indigenous. Right. We're talking about large populations of groups who were uh, forcibly yeah. brought here, yeah. and that, that needs to be addressed too. They weren't sure. settlers. Right. They didn't come here on their own volition, right. and uh, there's a, that really needs to be addressed within the sure. this there's uh, something uh, you're totally right. The the um, the, the relationship um, um, it, both those who are forcibly uh, forcibly brought, um, as well as those who come as as immigrants later, especially from communities of color, still articulate primarily to the settler society. Very very few articulate primarily to the indigenous society, and so they can escape from a certain perspective um, this elimination of this philosophy. The relationship. Uh, is much more one of ex extraction and exploitation. And so um, it, now in the Soviet Union, there was a lot of the literature that came out about internal colonialism, where they talked about the way that Russia would reorganize power in Azerbaijan or, you know, or, uh, or Kazakhstan, for example. And that discussion of internal colonialism in most of us as settler societies is, is, is somewhat analogous uh, and probably, I don't want to say identical to, but very close to the internalization of white supremacy. It's, it's much more an articulation of systemic white supremacy than it would be a reorganization of power. Because the reorganization of power was bringing them in the first place. You know, was, was, was the slave trade in the first place, was the reorganization of it. Um, and so, um, uh, and then we have even more comp uh, complex examples. So in the United States, we have, for example, a Chicano identity, which articulates primarily to the settler society, but carries with it indigeneity. And so, uh, you know, how... How do we relate uh, to that? And I don't purport to have New York identity. Too. Yeah, New York identity of yeah, the me metropole settler yeah. uh, bridge like that. But you know, and you find that a lot with a lot of pastoralist you know societies, no matter where they are. Kazakhstan is a, is a real big example of that. Uh, but you see it, uh, you see it in Palestine, you see it in Egypt, other places where, where Bedouin populations uh, lose grazing land to the enclosure of of land, and thus the, the pastoralist or nomadic whether it's uh, peripatetic or, or pastoralist, uh, you know, is kind of like eliminated. The, 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 this idea of, of, of us, and again, the, the, that we bring up talking about migrant justice, this idea that, that our, us as settler societies are, na are a nation of immigrants, it's very seductive. But, but there's something fundamental in the, in the distinction between the settler and the immigrant that maybe it's beyond correction. In some cases, it certainly is. Um, but is it possible to become a nation of immigrants? For example, uh, maybe you were five, six, seven, ten generations even born or descended, you know, from from the settler society. 
but uh, is it possible to become a nation of immigrants as a settler society, to, to, to recognize and articulate to indigenous sovereignty? I mean, in some cases, it's totally impossible, right? I mean, there's no Manhattan or Delaware sovereignty left because all the Manhattans and Delawares are dead, you know? But, but they're, they're, it, that doesn't mean that there isn't a way to, to work inside of, um, uh, uh, for example, native title or something like that to find a way that, that we can kind of change our own narrative and instead of making it this kind of a wave of immigration and colonization in a positive sense, um, to change our narrative, to recognize you know, the, the, the destructiveness of being settlers and find a way to uh, become immigrants. Uh, uh, an understanding of First Nations struggle. In the UK, it's called the Troubles, right? With the Settler Society in Northern Ireland. Um, but um, but the, um, as well as like the, 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 the narrative of, of colonization that we find in, like, in the travel writings of you know, what's his name, uh, Purchase, right? And uh, who's the guy who wrote The Fairy Queen? Spen Spen Edmund Spencer, for example, which, I mean, the, the, the whole kind of, the basis of this whole poetry and, and travel uh, writing uh, comes from the colonizing narratives of Ireland and, uh, and uh, Virginia, actually. Um, but, but the, um, um, maybe to, uh, I agree it's a tall order, right? But that's the whole point of having the discussion, right? I mean, if we can't think about you know, discussion hard problems, we should just go to the beach. Um, but, uh, I mean, for real, I mean, if we're not going to be serious, let's go to the beach, right? So, but, but the, um, um, but maybe, maybe like to, to, to uh, come back, like what, 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 what he brought up about uh, respecting the treaties is something we hear a lot from uh, like the American Indian Movement and others as well, right? And so how do we, uh, like inside our anarchist discourse, you know, how do we, uh, how do we approach that? You know, we're recognizing both individual rights but also collective rights. So what, what's, how do we approach it? We, we, we have to be really careful not to uh, uh, reduce decolonization to a discussion of anti-capitalism. You know, I mean, decolonization doesn't, uh, ending capitalism doesn't decolonize any more than it ends patriarchy. You know, it could if we do it right, but, but they're not inherently connected.